Welcome to the series of webinars on one of the very important subject in CA curriculum which is uh, ABR, so advanced business reporting. So first of all you must be wondering that you know uh, the reason why, so I have been uh, basically lecturing in the areas of corporate governance auditing for 15 years, the reason why I am going to discuss ABR because ABR is advanced business reporting, why there is you know kind of auditing and governance lecturer talking about this subject, that is one other thing you want to ask because I am sure uh, some of you may not be aware about the rationale as to why there is a significant governance and auditing component as a part of ABR syllabus. First of all, you may want to know why it is ABR, right, rather than uh, AFR, right. So when you say AFR, it is about advanced financial reporting. Now what is ABR? It is advanced business reporting. Now we need to understand when it comes to business, the language of the business, the language in which CEOs, right, managers and other key stakeholders holders talk. So that captures in this name advanced business reporting. So when you look at it, essentially all of you know, right, I mean I am actually speaking to set of students, right, I am sure all of you, right, on the verge of becoming chartered accountant. This may be one of, one of your subject because this is the highest level, right, strategic level. They are, you may have to do only one or two papers, right. Now usually under business report, you know AFR what we look at is financial statements, the process of financial statements, preparation of financial statements. As all of you know, this is based on SLFRS, right. Then other complex topics that comes under this is consolidation, right, consolidated financial statement. So traditionally I am talking when it comes to a subject like financial reporting, right, SLFRSs, consolidation and then analytical reviews, uh, financial statement analysis. These are the traditional, you know, topics which is under advanced financial reporting, right. But when financial reporting comes to the business, right, as a business language, you need to understand the holistic thinking. For example, one of the big topic today, right, if you look at uh, the lot of research says that the financial, now to what level financial statement shows the true value of a company. So that is, you will wonder by looking at that number, right, I cannot exactly remember, but I can probably uh, mention you that number when I take my session on integrated reporting, right. I am sure it is uh, less, it is about 50 percent, right. That means more than 50 percent is not reflected in the financials. So then when you look at a business holistically, non-financial reporting has a big role to play, right. And today if you look at uh, some of the trend, now you can Google and see the power of integrated reporting around the world, right, because annual report comes as a story, right, every piece of information from CEO's reports to chairman's report to operational reports to environmental report to financial statements goes like a story. In the middle of the story you get the business model, right. Business model is how company is going to make money, right. When we talk about business model, every company has input, right. And in today's language, usually we know, right, from financial reporting angle, input is, you know, just capital, financial capital. But today, we are talking about six types of capital, multiple capitals, right. Now, for you to run a business, you need, you need not only to have money, you need to have factories, right, that is your manufactured capital. Without people, how are you going to, uh, sorry, without the right people, human capital, how are you going to make money? And if you look at some of the very successful companies, say Amazon, Apple and so on, see the power of brain, where is intellectual capital coming? And then can any company or any person survive without oxygen? Can you do business without public roads? That is where natural capital comes. And then you can see successful companies, they always have very good relationship, right? So that is where the relationship capital comes. Now this story of using all this capital, right? And then whatever business you are doing, maybe manufacturing, right? You use these different types of input and through your business process, you convert it to output. 
and then this output becomes outcome right when it comes to outcome again you have same six types of capital now this is I am actually now not doing a session on integrated reporting but I want to describe this as one of the key subject of a chartered accountant because you all are the one who will talk to everybody in the world if you look at a company when I say everybody in the world I refer to stakeholders this is the story of my company it's not only financial it's multifaceted so that's where advanced business reporting comes so when I okay now why with my explanation I'm telling you what is in your syllabus as well so it takes into account non-financial reporting and for you to be successful as a business what really matters who govern the business right now you would have seen many successful companies around the world for example Enron was known those days out of fortune 500 companies if I'm not mistaken about seventh company in the list right but what happens eventually to that company disappeared like that billion dollar companies failed that is because they had fantastic reporting numbers were good but they have a governance failure so corporate governance set the tone of what is being reported so end of the day right what is being reported is misstated falsified then users are going to be deceived right so that is where corporate governance has a big role to play right together with that all the example that I cited now shows unethical behavior so ethics ethics of a chartered accountant preparing reliable financial statements as well as ethics of business leaders matters so again these are your syllabus topics right corporate governance ethics then finally when it comes to financial statements everybody is keen on the reported profit what is the profit right and uh, total asset value because if you look at many ratios the financial analyst data is based on these uh, numbers therefore as chartered accountants you need to know when it comes to annual report right that has a set of financial statements with a profit and the turnover for profit turnover and the asset base right sometimes because what I explained to you the agency conflict I will come to all this topic uh, you know in a little while agency conflict where management and board they are supposed to use right they are supposed to use the funds of principal who is the principal shareholders for their own benefits but actually they are misusing right and they are doing window racing right in the financial statements therefore you need to have somebody's report that gives credibility about numbers who is that somebody and that is auditor right that somebody is the auditor so then there is a language so auditor is always challenging CFO say you are a CFO when you become a chartered accountant one day you are a CFO or a finance manager right your job of one of your major job is to ensure the numbers are right and then you will have a lot of pressures if you are working in an unethical company if the governance is not good there is a lot of pressure for you to make numbers not to show the right numbers right so in that context auditor comes and gives this message message to shareholders look here the reported numbers are not right they are materially misstated I'm using that word materially misstated that's a very important word and as advanced business reporting students I am asking you do you really know the meaning of RMM risk of material misstatement right technically speaking what it is the misstatement is defined right as the amount company has reported and the amount that should be reported by applying the financial reporting framework now do you know the term financial reporting framework what is meant by a fair presentation framework what is meant by a compliance framework right so these are the terminology that you should be aware so anyway coming back to my point when auditor says look here your numbers are wrong and we are going to have a separate paragraph in your audit report saying that there is a uncertainty about the fair valuation that you have done you have learned in AFR fair valuation but audit is challenging this is not right 
that is where auditing comes in. But remember, I am telling there is a lot of misunderstanding about students. Do not view this as auditing subject in AFR, but view this as a component of financial reporting, right? To be for you to be a holistic financial reporting person, you need to understand the pieces of governance ethics controls as well as how your numbers can go wrong. For that, certain terminology, concepts, tools used by the auditor may be very important. And do not forget, end of the day, you will have a very tough you know discussion that do you like to go to your managing director and say, look here, auditors are going to give us a qualified report. Auditors are going to give us a CAM paragraph saying that, you know, our valuation, there is uncertainty and managing director may not like to see this. And that is where as a CFO, you need to have a dialogue with the auditor. Look here, right? This is our context. I am not saying to cheat auditor, but to have a constructive dialogue. And you need to be able to understand what is auditor's concern, right? So that is the whole idea of material misstatement. So that is where we understand first of all what is materiality. So I am writing several words and in a little while I will underline these words. What is materiality? Right? And then you need to also have a question about how these risks are identified. Right? Is it coming from business risk? Is it because of inherent risk, is it because of failure in internal controls, right? Now this is where the risk arises and is it material, right? And how the most importantly, right, what are some of the key financial reporting standards which deals with risk in particular, right? If you look at certain SLFRSs like SLFRS 13, fair valuation. Right? These are very important now level 1, level 2, level 3 when there is a level 3 valuation which is very uncertain and there is a greater chance auditor may say that you know uh, we have to write in, your, in our audit report although we are not qualifying the audit I am sure some of you may ask what is CAM I have never heard key audit matters right and see there is constant dialogue between the audit partner and maybe company CFO finance director you know about whether we are going to change our audit report, whether we are going to have a CAM, whether we are going to have emphasis of matter and so on. So, and then do not forget auditors also will write to the board saying that you know these are the internal control deficiencies. Now all these will be thrown out, right? thrown at the accountant to question you know why our internal controls are not sound, right? why audit is going to give an emphasis of matter right? So and so on. Now some of the accounting standards. It can be fair valuation, it can be SLFRS 9 financial instrument, right? Now, when there is a financial instrument, say fair value through PNL equity accounted uh, investment, right, or OCI, the question is, is it fairly presented, right? Then, if you look at the way auditors looked at, for example, there is auditing standard called auditing standard number 540, which helps auditor to ascertain whether estimates estimates used are reasonable and if you read the auditing standard how to measure whether it is reasonable they refer back to the back, back to SLFRS for example there is a share based payment right the SLFRS 2 says share based payment has to be valued at the grant date right at the fair value so then what is fair value so whenever there is a fair value, here there is a fair value standard in accounting, but auditors look at essentially whether this fair value is right, whether fair value right depends on has the right data been used, has the assumption used, right, are they reasonable, uh, what is the valuation model that is being used. Is that generally used valuation model or entity specific one? Is there an expert who helped in the valuation? And whether this valuation, what are the controls over this valuation? Is it done by a very junior person or audit committee has reviewed it? So like that, if auditors are not happy, you know, finally auditor will say, this is a CAM. We have to highlight this in the auditor's report, right? 
of course, uh, there is no problem with your estimate. Still, auditor can highlight that's another thing. Then you have to tell management, look here, having a CAM is not a modification in the audit report. When I say modification, auditors are saying con based on their evidence that financial statements are materially misstated. Now, all what I was trying to tell you is that we have not, if you look at the syllabus, it does not say auditing. There is 25 percent syllabus coverage, 25 percent syllabus coverage on risk of material misstatement. That is for you to understand certain concepts like how financial statements, amount, disclosures, or account balances can be material misstated. The concept of assertion, how assertions can be used to evaluate potential misstatements in financial statements. These concepts, when you become a chartered accountant, right? It will nurture you as a mature chartered accountant to look at broadly the reported numbers from many angles and also to understand the bigger perspective of numbers in terms of business reporting. You see what I am trying to say now a lot of students I am sure because this, this was a syllabus change. Now originally you know this uh, now I think I will come to that and show you in the new syllabus how. Uh, this subject is placed along with other subjects. So, therefore, but please understand if you are preparing for this paper, I am telling you AFR is going to be about 55 percent, right? The win, what is balance? 45 percent. That is, I would describe them as governance, ethics, and risk of material misstatement. Right, so that you can. I am telling while there is a lot of use of auditor's terminology, but that subject is more pitch or placed from the perspective of finance CFO or a finance manager or accountant's perspective. So, this is 25 percent of the syllabus, and governance is 15 percent of the syllabus that makes 40. Right, governance including non financial reporting, right, things like integrated reporting, and then there is 5 percent coverage on ethics. So, this is where 45 percent of this syllabus comes, and therefore, I would probably say this is going to be a very challenging paper in future and going to be one of the very important subject which nurture you as a technically competent chartered accountants, right, who can advise to the board about not only numbers, but the language of the business, that is business reporting. So, that is my introduction and I said I want to highlight some word, I, this is a very cluttered diagram now. So, what, what is here? What have I explained to you? The first point that I made, this subject is about business reporting. When we say business reporting, we have to look at things like integrated reporting, IR. The other part that I explained to you, the numbers accuracy, accuracy is not a right word, where the numbers are fair depends on the financial reporting framework and that framework is the accounting standards that you are talking about SLFRSs. SLFRSs have been applied or not, right? That is what is measured by the misstatement, right? Therefore, you need to be able to interpret how a misstatement can arise in different accounting standards, right? So, I know the, the, the when it comes to the significant revisions of this subject, uh, the study text, there is a delay in issuing those documents, but I am sure by looking at the detailed syllabus content, you are able to uh, kind of understand what are the specific uh, topics that you have to study. So, again coming to my summary of the introduction, you can see the last point that I now explained to you, the misstatements, are they material, right? So, that is where the concept like assertion, materiality, business risk and also areas like uh, reporting matters, say CAM or emphasis of matter or modification, things like that and you need to understand. So, that is a kind of quick introduction and now I will uh, take you through what are we going to do in these sessions, right? And you can take a look at few slides and uh, if you look at the slide that appears, uh, now through this webinar series, uh, what we are trying to do, I am sure with me another lecturer will take on the area of 
financial reporting, right, which is I would still say the core of this subject, right. Uh, but when it comes to this part of the syllabus, right, in particular, the few sessions that I am going to deliver, and I am sure I could probably meet you when the pilot paper is ready uh, to kind of discuss uh, the topics that I am covering today together with the pilot paper. So, essentially during this uh, discussions that I will cover, so you could probably say this as a huge subject like ocean. So, therefore, uh, I am specifically focusing on examinable topics and then I always say if you want to be successful in the exam, three things matters, right? Over the years of ex uh, lecturing experience, uh, these are really important, right? You need to have the knowledge. The knowledge is about clarity of those concepts and in the syllabus language, uh, this is called learning outcome, right? You should know, for example, if you are studying corporate governance for 15 percent, can you take a piece of paper and put some of the concepts that examine is going to test? Then you are a very intelligent, smart student, smart student, right? While you have to read about say 500 pages, you have in few pages what is examinable, right? So, therefore, uh, knowledge matters and knowledge is useless if you do not know how to apply knowledge in a particular context. And finally, what matters is you know finally. Uh, exam is about what you write in the paper. So, the art of writing an answer, right, that we are going to discuss. So, therefore, uh, these three things really matters. Uh, so, if you look at the slide again, we will be discussing how master in theory and applying and I will also guide you on certain study techniques, you know, rather than having to read a huge book right, how can we quickly get into the learning points and most importantly, maybe when I meet you again, I want to discuss with you the art of writing an answer, how to develop your own case studies with confidence. Like I explained to you, the syllabus, right, this is very important for you to understand the bigger picture of the syllabus, right. Now, you can see where uh, there is your subject, your our pillar here. Uh, financial accounting and reporting and then there is BL1, right, and uh, then there is uh, CL2, right, and then there is SL1 say in advanced business reporting at strategic level and I am sure you are already aware that this is an open book examination and then you must be wondering now because I explained to you the uh, content of the syllabus right, what are the open books. So, we will also discuss that point. And then what I want to tell you, if you similarly look at auditing pillar, right, the audit assurance and ethics, there is BL5 and actually during the pandemic season, right, time that we are living in a very uncertain world during last uh, four weeks, I would say I have been helping the institute to conduct webinars for all these subjects, especially BL5 and advanced auditing CL1 in particular, highly exam focused sessions. You can ask uh, your colleagues to watch these all the webinars conducted by the institute and get the maximum benefit, right. And similarly, you will wonder why there is no audit in here, right. The reason, the rationale of this is now you understand certain aspects of governance, controls, right, and even risk in financial statements have now been captured under SL1. The other thing, if you still want to be a practitioner, right, for example, in a, in a very simple language, you want to be a partner of audit firm and there is another paper called PPM, Professional Practice Management, right. So, that is a very advanced technical paper. So, therefore, I think you have a very good understanding now about the composition of this paper and this is why, this is where in the slide you can very clearly see the coverage which I explained to you, right. And uh, then, uh, especially you can see this is revised syllabus, right. 
and uh, so I am sure if any one of you are not aware about this and now I do not think that institute has postponed exam forever right you will because you have to understand while we are uh, now living in a uh, you know lockdown mood I am I am sure today is uh, uh, just after Vesak, right. So, probably 11th uh, today is Saturday, right, the 11th which is Monday. I am sure the gradually we will, uh, they will, government will open up and but from students point of view, institute has not stopped the work when it comes to learning. So, that is where this webinar series uh, have been conducted and therefore, be ready for the exam at any time. If you are a good student, now you have to understand I think one of the benefit of this while there are a lot of negative consequences of this time that remember it also gives you lot of time available because now you do not have time to waste on the road in transport or anywhere and now you have your prime time at home to concentrate and do some uh, studies because end of the day our life is very short every minute in the life is very important. So, I am just advising you by looking at the syllabus content, if you have only studied accounting and the consolidated accounts, you have covered only 55 percent and do not forget these elements and if you have not done yet, do not worry this session webinar series will really guide you to you know uh, get into the details of this and to be well prepared to handle exam question that is where I said uh, we will uh, connect this to uh, whenever pilot paper is ready uh, we will also I will also spend time with you to analyze cases and to guide you as to how to write an answer for a question of you know this area 25 percent and then uh, even corporate governance. So, the next question that you want to ask do you know the structure of this paper you can read the syllabus and probably this will have a very similar structure to the pre scene concept that we had earlier syllabus right. And you know under pre scene usually if you look at previous syllabus we have 50 marks question. So, you will have similar setup. But what I am saying in, in a such a case study, if there is a question of 50 marks and I am sure in addition to preparation of console consolidated accounts or accounting standard that will have some coverage of this area of C because you cannot isolate C from B. When you prepare financial statements, you need to understand how they can be misstated. So, that is where uh, C comes. Some students describe this as auditing, yeah those who want to describe like that uh, probably the relevant topics for auditing related concept is C and corporate governance is definitely not uh, auditor subject per se, it is uh, the broad umbrella of things under which everything comes corporate governance is about board of directors and how companies are governed and controlled through various mechanisms. Right, And uh, so, I am showing this uh, do not uh, be surprised by looking at this picture, but I am just asking you having looked at the syllabus content, uh, what book you know are these book open or what books may be relevant right. I think before coming to the institute, I actually checked uh, from the websites and I asked have we communicated to students the books which are applicable right. Of course, uh, corporate governance books. Uh, has been mentioned right, but there is no mentioning about any of the balance book right. Uh, so, I am uh, actually I am sure they will allow right uh, for you to use uh, at least uh, main auditing standard book and ethics books. But then having said that I am also telling you when it comes to this subject it is not really you know auditing for you to go through auditing standard and you will wonder how to go to the exam hall are you going to carry a big bag with so many books which contain more than 1000 book pages right. So, then what I am telling if you properly learn auditing uh, related concepts which are linked to risk of misstatement that may be few auditing standards, but still you have to go through those standards for example, going concern. Now, you can look at the detailed syllabus huh? there is all these are mentioned in the syllabus while the study, te study text is still uh, we are waiting for that. But if you look at the detailed syllabus they even explain what are the auditing standards that are applicable. I can actually tell you 
uh, but today I will not be taking topic C, but I will be taking topic D which is corporate governance and non-financial which, which is specially corporate governance, right, which is a very important topic. So, the when it comes to uh, auditing standards, there are certain standards that matter. So, I, I am sure it is still worthwhile for students to have the confidence, you know, can we still refer this as open book, then there is no necessity for them to, you know, remember certain things and whenever you can refer an answer. Uh, so, let us hopefully wait for that, uh, uh, that to come as open book, but I am sure still uh, you are able to handle this paper as long as uh, you are thorough with uh, some of these concepts which are connected to topic C. I am very specific when I talk, you have to really concentrate. And I have been conducting few webinars over the last two months, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, the last few weeks. So, one of the very important advice I want to give you before we start our detailed discussion today is that you are going to, I am telling with confidence that you are, you will learn lot of things. As I said, it is not for the namesake. You can see how, uh, how powerful these webinars uh, at the end and then actually when you face the exam, you will see how effective this method of studies. Nowadays, students are sometimes, I think it is, uh, you know, this is about the world. This is the world we are living. It is changing. Right. Traditionally, you have to go to a class, spend lot of times, you know, in the traffic and you are going and listening to lecture, right, and come and imagine you are going to stay in a class three hours, but for your traveling, you have spent another three hours, so two hours and you are tired after that. But this is a fantastic opportunity at any time. You can be in your personal, you know, space of, you know, in your own room or wherever, boarding place or wherever you are and you may be with your phone, right. The power of this is, this enables you to study from anywhere. So, that is the beauty of technology. So, therefore, but I am telling you do not just limit this to like, you know, watching something from YouTube, right. To make the best use of this, I am always suggesting, right, have a book, small booklet with you. You see, when I am having a book with me, right, very critical notes, right, sometimes this book may have thousand pages uh, of uh, summarized into few pages. So, it is very important for you to write down in a piece of paper, maybe a few A4s, right, uh, some of the critical learning points of these sessions and I will always pause and say write down. So, now, while I am in a room with no students, with Suraj here, I mean in a typical, you know, it may also be odd to talk like that directly to the camera, but now it has been kind of, you know, habit of doing this for s several times. But the point for you is that when you watch this video, pause it, right, and always ask, did I understand? And if you understood it, write it, draw it. So, I am going to paint, you know, draw a lot of pictures today and that will really help you to understand very detailed complex concept in a very simple way. And also this is like, you know, what we call this, uh, you can say this is kind of uh, uh, analogy. What is analogy, right? You take some other picture and explain some different concepts, analogy, right? You can, for example, you can uh, relate management to a car. That is the analogy, right. Today, I will take some analogy in governance, you know, how to explain some of the complex concepts in a very simple form, right. And uh, so, I hope you remember my advice, right, because I will tell you write down this. So, if you write it, post the video and write it, because I, I cannot show you everything in slide, I will write so many things sometimes, what I write very fast in the board may not be clear. Now, with that very clear introduction, let us come to the subject. Now, when it comes to corporate governance, I am now straight on the syllabus, right. You can see this slide, look at it carefully. I said examinable topics, right. Now, if you are a very exam focused student, exam is next week, what is the most important document you should take a look before going to the exam? And that is syllabus, learning outcome. Remember, if I am an examiner preparing a paper, I cannot set a question which is totally outside the syllabus learning outcome. It has to be connected to the syllabus learning outcome. In that sense, if you look at corporate governance, right, we break corporate governance into three in the syllabus, right, that 20, 15 percent coverage, break into three and discuss, right. So, out of this, uh, you can see 
there is theory of corporate governance, theory and practices, and there is board of director as a topic, right? And there is audit committee, right? But I would say, again, you have to be exam oriented, right? Of course, while knowledge is very important, but end of the day, you have to pass the exam as well. So, now there can be lot of theories that you will learn, but those theories are very useful. Then only you will really understand these other concepts. But for the exam point of view, things like board of directors, audit committees are very important. Remember, by no means I am saying this is not important. But having this theoretical knowledge, you should be able to understand and articulate the board of directors. Different, for example, uh, if you are given a case study and examiner is asking you evaluate the effectiveness of board. Now, you have a question that how can I answer this question? I have no idea about what board effectiveness. That is where if you look at the detailed syllabus, there are various framework. You can analyze board effectiveness uh, in the form of for example, if examiner says use 6 C framework, right. Now, oh, you will wonder what this, I have never heard this, right. So, these are mentioned in the syllabus. And then you can analyze board effectiveness based on board functions. So, what are the main board functions, right. And you can also evaluate the effectiveness of board by looking at the board composition and overall setup. For example, that is where the typical corporate governance code requirements comes, the CEO chair split, are there independence directors and how decisions are made, right. And overall board effectiveness, there are um, some of the key concepts that will affect board effectiveness. So, that is where board concept like board diversity, right. Now, if you do not know this concept, uh, I am not surprised that you cannot answer this paper corporate governance section, right. The diversity of the board and women on board. So, those are big topics in corporate governance, right. And uh, uh, again, there are different board structures that you need to be aware. So, all of this are like I said earlier, these are knowledge. So, therefore, first thing and this is a very important picture you see in the slide, right. Uh, so, those are the three topics that comes under corporate governance. So, now uh, we are going to start uh, theory in corporate governance. Like I said, highly exam oriented student is checking the possibility of any question for that you are comparing what you learn with the syllabus. So, I am now connecting each and every point in the syllabus as to how question can come and how question can be answered, right. So, I am uh, I want you to read this uh, in the slide. You can see, can you read it carefully and see whether you understand 4.2.1. Do you understand 4.2.1? It says, discuss the concepts of corporate governance from multiple perspectives and different perspectives. But if you carefully look at, there is a column in the syllabus called specific knowledge and that breaks this into two topics. That is the detail. Now, this is a very important quality of a chartered accountant. And in my own experience, I will say some board of directors really like chartered accountants generally. Why? Because you have been trained in such a way that you are looking lot of details. We call this quality as attention to detail. Now, some people are you know really confused. They do not look at the detail. They just look at a paper and you know make decisions without going through the details. So, attention to detail. You see two things. All these words can we explain corporate governance operationally as relationship, as stakeholders, using financial economics and then using society, societal perspectives. Now, these words are not just labels, every word has a meaning, otherwise words are useless. So, therefore, I am challenging you. Because if you are ready for the exam, if you understand, I mean, in your study pack, this may be, for example, when study pack comes, you will see several pages written, forget them, 
and understand if you cannot explain okay this is the operational perspective of corporate governance this is the relationship now you have that practical understand it right then now this is a very tough question for most now when i do corporate governance teaching right i ask this question at many forum not only from chartered students even maybe from at universities right when this question was asked a lot of people don't have answers what is the difference between governance and management is there a difference between governance and management some people get stuck don't know right so today we will debate on this so now you have looked at already the slide so let me to explain this right uh, in 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 some detail i think uh, we will again look at i want to show you a picture right uh, now when you look at uh, the this picture right what you see here they can see this picture uh, what do you see there so i want you to see by looking at a picture you can tell a story right forget what is written in the right side look at the picture what does it epitomizes now you can see again if you have attention to detail you can have lot of stories by looking at this picture do you see that there is a chess board behind what does it mean and it means the business the game of the business if you want to be successful in a business it is like a game in this game you are a player and there are multiple players right playing in different uh, with lot of uncertainty so who are the multiple players you have competitors customers suppliers government and so on and you got your own strategy and act so that is where you know uh, the chess board uh, may be the business and then there is set of people you know especially there is one person you can see the way that person is what he is doing now who is that person he is taking a risk you know by having to walk uh, on a very thin line kind of you know thread and he is in danger which means when you make business decisions that you have to make certain decision which involves risk and then whether you are taking the people who will kind of approve is this right or wrong or debate and they may be board of directors right and then there is a hand like invisibly they scrutinize what board is doing it may be the stakeholders using the auditor and maybe the audit function is scrutinizing you see this picture also tells the story of governance so i am going to see you if you have to listen to me right properly in this video i am i am telling you with confidence at the end of maybe this 4 hours you will have expertise in corporate governance not only after watching the video after that you have some background work to do and i will guide you to do that and then understand be a living student in governance don't be a book student where you will memorize something and go right so basically uh what i want to tell you is that if the first thing you will learn now take your book and right from now the first learning point is what is corporate governance right so the governance from multiple perspective so this is where we start what is governance right and it has like like i explained to you multiple perspective you have to understand this concept uh, operationally what governance means and as relationship what does it means and then from uh, financial economics perspective what does it means and then uh, what does it means from stakeholder perspective and then what does it means by the societal perspective now once you know this you will be happy that i can handle if i examine a test anything from this area okay first of all the definition of corporate governance even before going there right i will tell you when you look at the slide right now one of the book which is a very famous book uh, written in 70s i am sure you are not born even in that uh, sorry uh, there is no way this is not 1000 uh, 1700 right this is adam smith we call father of economics he says 
Adam Smith talks about governance in 1070s. What is the statement? Directors are the managers of other people money, right? Directors are managers of other people's money rather than managing their own money. Now, whose money directors manage? Whose pocket? It is their pocket to others pocket. Others pocket. Therefore, Adam Smith says, you cannot expect them to take care of that money with same anxious vigilance. Anxious vigilance means you are very careful about how money is being spent. So, you cannot expect that. In other words, you know I want you to write down this if you do not know. What is the perennial problem of corporate governance? Please write agency conflict. Now, this is in your syllabus. This is bread and butter of corporate governance. There is no corporate governance without agency theory. It is such a major theory in corporate governance, right? What is agency theory? Now, Adam Smith talks about it, right? Now, principle of a company, the owners of a company, they are the principal, that is shareholders. Then who are the managers? That is directors and managers, right? They are the agent. You expect agent to do maximum and give you the maximum return, but they will still misuse. And that is the agency conflict. That is very important that you understand. So, if you want to write down agency conflict, do you want to write what you write? Again, it is very important. Now, one of the things we see in past papers, having attended exam committee meetings for over uh, uh, about 15 years, I am telling you, one of the comments, especially in auditing governance, this type of area is that uh, students' writing skill is absolutely poor. Right. I would probably say one reason is that you are some lot of chartered students, maybe they are, they say, okay, this is a theory subject very difficult. There is no theory as such right be a living student in any subject. So, my point for you is that uh, the when you learn something right you have to be absolutely clear about it and then have always right always right in your own words. Now, I want to now I am testing you. Huh? So, can you write agency conflict in your own words what would you write? So, if you have that writing power, you are going to pass the exam. But the next problem is students, they overwrite. That is uh, when I say over, you, they write more than what is required. So, how do you write agency conflict? The conflict where, right, directors and managers who are supposed to be agent who should act on the for the benefit of shareholders may misuse shareholder funds for their own benefits. That is the definition. That is your definition, your explanation. So, anyway, what you learn now is agency conflict, learn, learn in one. So, I am keeping a track of what we learn also today, right. Uh, so, we learn agency conflict and then we are looking definitions of corporate governance from multiple perspective. So, uh, when you look at this slide, oh, uh, I have already written on the board corporate governance from multiple perspectives. So, first of all, I would like to ask the corporate governance formal definition was introduced first time in the world in 92 with the Cadbury report. They explain corporate governance in just two words. It is a system by which companies are directed and controlled. System by which companies are directed and control. Now, see these two words are very powerful and whatever definition you look at in corporate governance, it is described as a system by which companies are directed and controlled. Now, you have to carefully slow down and see corporate governance as a system and what is meant by direction and what is meant by control. And I would say that is the operational definition of corporate governance. Now, see we learn that. It is a system by which companies are directed and controlled, operational definition, right. So, but then if you want to explain that further, this operational definition of corporate governance as a system. Now, then you have to explain what is the direction of a company and who gives the direction. Now, when you say direction of a company, you are essentially re referring to the purpose of the company. Why the company is there? Why does it exist? So, that is where the strategic mission comes. For example, Amazon says, we strive to offer our customers the lowest possible, right, the best available selection at utmost convenience, anything you order, right, lowest cost, utmost convenience, the best product, 
that is what Amazon.com, I am sure number one company in the world now, they say this is our mission. If they are, if that is their strategic mission, they can't do anything that violates strategic mission. For example, Amazon is going to start another business which makes customer very inconvenient to purchase, right? And lot of product returns and so on, right? So then they are violating their strategic mission. So then direction is guided by a mission and you know some companies, uh, they are cheating the shareholders, stakeholders, right? They make money and vanish. Therefore, this mission has also to be guided by values of the company, right, mission values. And having clarified this future, companies will set targets which we call business objectives. It may be company's annual budget and then they have various strategies. So, putting all this together, now you hear this word strategy, policy, right, and mission values, all these are part of direction setting, right. And once the direction is set in terms of the mission of the company, vision of the company, mission of the company and strategies, then you will have to control to ensure company will achieve, continue to achieve their objective. This is where lot of control elements comes under corporate governance. So, when it comes to control, you know, for example, we will learn in few, in a little while NEDs. What is NEDs? Non-executive directors, they are considered as guardians of corporate governance. So, there are various committees looking at numbers, right? That is audit committee. Looking at whether companies run by the right directors, that's nomination committee. Looking at whether directors are fairly paid. Looking at whether accounts can be misstated or the uh, company can misuse use in related party there is another committee called RPT committee looking to ensure that the company is not uh, affected by cyber security now there are controls on cyber security to ensure whether companies covering uh, business reporting there is now a lot of attention in corporate governance on ESG matters now these are new words for you I am sure some of you do not know what ESG means ESG refers to environmental social and governance matter. Okay, when I give you, low, so that is my patterns of teaching, I give lot of exam, uh, lot of explanation and then slow down and come back. But if you sometimes you get confused, if you are not with me while watching the video, your mind goes somewhere else, then you will be lost. What is the point that I explained to you? Operational perspective of corporate governance, that is the definition. Operational perspective means how does it work? Corporate governance is a system, right? by which direct by which company is directed and controlled if you want to write another sentence who will direct the company that is direct why directors are called director because they are directing the behavior future of the company right so another sentence that you will uh, write the board of directors provide direction for the company right and be responsible for the governance the shareholders role is to ensure the right board is in place, right? So, that is kind of operational perspective of corporate governance. I hope you are writing some notes. Operational perspective you can explain by definition. The other part of corporate governance is to look at this as a relationship. Now, for example, you will see in my slide this uh, lot of definition today OECD. OECD is a famous o global organization called Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. They have later explained, they have given another ex extended definition of corporate governance. I will show you that. Uh, this this kind of definition, right? So, they define corporate governance as relationship with three parties. Can you guess who are the three parties? Essentially, there is a board of directors, right? And there is a management and then there is a shareholders and other stakeholders. Shareholders plus other stakeholders. If you want to run any business, there should be a board, management and shareholder and all other stakeholders, your customer, supplier, competitors, government and so on. Stakeholder means anybody who is interested in the company, who is affected by the company's decision, right? So, see this definition. Now, if you look at the slide carefully, there are three elements of OECD definition. One is corporate governance is set of relationship between the company, board and the stakeholders. Number two, it also provides structure through which, remember I explained to you this, objectives are set, that is objective, mission, 
and the long term and short term objective. Remember why I say mission? Do not say this is management, why are we learning? No, see all this is business language, right? Mission is, now if I ask you as an individual, what is your mission? Why you are living? Do not say I am living because I was born, right? You are living for a purpose in life. So, what is company's purpose? I read Amazon mission now, I read already, right? Offer to our customers the lowest possible price. There is a mission statement and that guides you of how you accomplish that mission, right. So, then there is objectives and your strategies. You cannot just achieve that mission. You see how Amazon works through, uh, you know, so many, uh, they, they acquire many companies, right. Earlier that was a book company and now how they have expanded their uh, scope, which we, what is the word we call ecosystem. Right. So, their ecosystem, if you look at now, there are many, many uh, businesses, right, uh, through maybe uh, strategies like JVs and acquisitions, mergers and so on. And finally, another piece of this definition is corporate governance provide incentive for board and management to perceive objective, right, which are in the interest of the company. Now, finally, now, earlier we suspected directors and managers role, if they are properly governing, proper incentive means they should be incentivized. For example, companies making lot of profits and share prices are increasing. Now, you see in corporate governance we learn, right, share ownership scheme or executive share ownership scheme can motivate directors to work better and increase company's profit. Right, because that provides incentive for them to work actively. That is where corporate governance comes. So, I explained to you now two definition, right. Uh, one is Cadbury definition, uh, the other one is uh, OECD definition, right. So, this OECD definition covers relationship perspective, right. Then, what is financial economics perspective of corporate governance? That is simply looking corporate governance from because finally, no point of governance if you do not have money, shareholders are interested for them to receive right return on investment, right. So, financial economic perspective talks more about I am, I am writing one of the very important word in red color, right. Please write this in your book as an now I, I am sure what you have written up to now agency conflict, right. Then uh, you have to write another thing called uh, performance versus conformance. Performance versus conformance. What are these different words? Huh? So, these are just you know wonderful ways to explain corporate government. Performance, what matters when it comes to business is making money. That is to be profitable is performance. Conformance means you cannot make money at any cost. Now, uh, let us say when it comes to a bank in Sri Lanka, if bank wants to be profitable, right. For example, in deposits, can they offer any rates like 20 percent and get the deposit? No, central bank controls that. So, while you perform, you have to be ethical and following laws and regulation, all of that and uh, companies values. So, then how to strike a balance? We need to make money and we need to comply with different things. So, this performance conformance point of view, the financial economic perspective mostly talks about the performance side. So, the purpose of corporate governance is to ensure shareholders, right, investment is secure and they are going to get adequate return. So, I am sure you are writing something, right. So, investments are secure, right, and then they will get some ROI, then you know that. Then coming to stakeholder perspective and I am sure I can explain both together, these are very similar, right, stakeholder perspective. Now, if you look at financial economic perspective, you are only looking at shareholders funds, right. But look at, can a company be successful only by making profit for shareholders? Imagine if there is a company in Sri Lanka and they are in food processing and some of these food items that they have produced that has caused several diseases in the society and they are not paying taxes and they are exploiting uh, labor and they are using child labor, right. They are doing, you know, they are not paying to their suppliers. If there is a company like that, society will reject 
because remember company which is responsible for society that is where I mentioned to you ESG right environmental social and governance they are looking all three pieces of triple bottom line. So, they are looking economic now uh, here we talked only about economic economic means money we have to look at how companies business is going to affect the society at large right that is very important piece especially when you say society I mentioned to you at the start of my lecture. Now, the society relationship capital is a capital for companies today it is viewed as a capital right relationship capital right human capital intellectual capital in this area right a natural capital right now this capital can be diminished if company is not thinking and finally imagine such a company. Now, if you look at some of the famous companies in the world like Coca Cola, they now openly accept you know our product may be harmful, but at the same time they are spending lot of money on making uh, to develop you know to to uh, purify water and to folk and projects focusing on child uh, he health things like that. So, that is because right you as a company you look at the society's well being mostly and when you say stakeholder I have already covered it through companies operation you have to look at the interest of all stakeholders including customers, suppliers, government. So, everybody's interest then eventually such company can be successful. Now, we have learned one part of the syllabus right. So, that is one part if I go back to the slide right if you remember this is I mentioned to you this is in the syllabus right uh, this this is your syllabus we have covered this now you see how we are covering this is the effectiveness of this course the webinars that I am explaining to you uh, what is in the syllabus and how we learn that. The next point that we have to learn so you have to write again in your notes do you know the difference between governance and management that is a very interesting question to ask governance and management right. Uh, so, I will put that as the third point governance versus management right. What is the difference between governance versus management? So, this part we have learned. Now, again like I mentioned to you earlier some people do not know what is the difference between governance and management right. Now, if I ask you what is management, what is your answer? You can tell you know management in theory books we have learned is about planning right, then staffing, organizing, controlling this is management according to book definition, but practically in a company yeah, they, I agree with that definition right. If you look at management you can probably describe uh, and I am using this analogy of triangle and uh, triangle and circle in this explanation because this is an interesting analogy proposed by one of the most famous author in corporate governance right. He is Bob Tricker very profound author uh, in corporate governance right. So, I will uh, see this is management. So, management you have different layers of management you have CEO or managing director here and then you have different levels from the top right and then there is a governance here right. So, I am asking you if management is about making decision the so planning the product you know making sure there is right stuff putting them together and achieving organization objective that is management right. And uh, so, one you would probably say CEO is the leader of the management right you know CEO make decisions of an organization. But the question is you imagine CEOs right some of the CEOs who are in jail now I will have some photos I will show you in my presentation. Now, can you say that CEO can do anything? Now, you can see some of the CEOs now I think one of the good example when I say that for you to consider is uh, for example, now this whole calamity of uh, bond scam in Sri Lanka there is a company called perpetual uh, treasury right. Now, when you hear the people's name you can ask what is CEO's role 
and also we saw several reports saying uh, questioning the practices of different Sri Lankan companies. Then you can ask what is CEO's and management role? What, where was the board, were they sleeping? The question is what is the difference from uh, governance and management? I am coming to the answer now in this analogy, the circle has the power that is why circle is super in force on the triangle as governance and you can see these people, right? There are four here and also there are one, two, three here with the top man, let us say all together four here, one, two, three, four and there is another four around that. So, what is this? This circle you can describe, I would say as a power table, sorry power circle, what is the power? So, remember when it comes to governance, we are talking about exercise of power, right? When it comes to governance, what are we talking about? The boardroom, what happens at the boardroom? Now, you will hear the news, you remember yesterday, look at the news on the paper, CEO was sacked, sent home. That is the decision made by the board using their power, right? And the board has decided to discontinue, dispose that entire business. Board has decided to acquire another company. So, therefore, you will describe governance as what? Exercising power, strategy formulation, policy formulation and challenge in the management, question in the management. I repeat it, governance is different from management. It is about exercising power. And especially there are four things which is explained, right? Let me put those words, strategy. Without strategy, where is governance, right? It is about strategy formulation. It is about setting policy. This is how we should do the business. It is about being accountable to shareholders. Accountable means answerable, telling what has happened. And then finally, it is also about questioning management, monitoring. If you see a board of directors, they are only coming to board meeting and they accept whatever management says, they go through their reports, they only come for meeting. That is a board where board act as a rubber stamp. They put the stamp for the decision made by management. So therefore, if it is a good board, I am also connecting this discussion to board of directors, which you will learn today. So remember, these words are very important. So, therefore, this helps you to explain the difference between governance and management. Having explained to you that, I want you to now look at the slide carefully, the definition. You see, why? if you missed out anything, you can write down now, right? Governance is not management. It is about, see all the words that I mentioned, exercising power, formulating strategy, setting policy, supervising and being accountable, management is running the business, right? Board is the governing body and that board ensure that it is being run, well run, right? In the right direction, the board of directors, see this, this is the analogy that I explained to you from Bob Tricker, right? Now, I want to ask you, right? I, re, uh, I want to ask you if you look at uh, the white board, right? Before I show this diagram to you, I want you to look at uh, this diagram and ask this question. I am going to actually, because it will support my future explanation on the board of directors. So, I am, I am expanding this diagram in a big way, right? If I am telling that, uh, let us say this area, right? So, I, if, I, if I modify this analogy to say that, you know, one of the important tasks of, let me to use another color, of the board of directors, right, about strategy, formulation, right, and, uh, and then I am also drawing, uh, you see, if this is kind of a structure where a company is run and the board has the power and I will uh, probably use red color to show this is the power base. This is where our power originate, power originate from this. Can, can you tell, I cannot ask you question, please answer if there are students in this room, I want them to speak, right? So, what is the power base? 
the power base is about shareholders, because shareholders can you know uh, challenge the board and if you look at the shareholders especially I refer to, if you look at some of the companies there are shareholders called institutional shareholders, there are now for example, there are hedge funds, some funds invest in significant amount of shares and they put lot of pressure, please resign the CEO, they put pressure for CEO to resign. So, therefore, shareholders I would describe as a power base and then if that is the power base right, uh, coming down from the board level to management and they are what, what is the word I will write here, accountable, who, who is accountable, board right, the accountability is a very important role of the board of directors. So, I am when I am explaining the session on board of directors, same information will be useful for you. Then when it comes to the, see again this rectangle, I am telling that this is how you know board operates right, strategy formulation. And uh, so, the strategy formulation is all about let us say this is connected to external environment right, this is your external environment uh, where you get your pestle environment. Now, you will learn uh, when you read corporate governance some of the management without management there is no governance right. What is pestle environment? If you make decisions you have to look at how politics matters, uh, uh, eco political environment, economy in Sri Lanka currently, currency depreciation to all of that, the society's uh, impact because of the cr current crisis, uh, technology uh, right, legal and so on. Then there is also companies operating under five forces right, that is a very important uh, uh, tool that we can use to explain the environment, the five forces being the customers, bargaining power of the customers, suppliers, substitutes, rivalry right, those are uh, parts of five forces. Now, what I want to say is strategy formulation has to happen based on this environment, without this environment a strategy cannot work in isolation. That is strategy part, you have to learn this subject as a part of governance, how board of directors uh, connect to this. The other area where the board use their power to challenge the management is about uh, monitoring role, that is a very important role of the board of directors right, monitoring or supervising. This is where you see in a board meeting, if you are one day when you become a CFO of a company, your accounts may be questioned by the finance director, this is not right and question and now see sometimes finance direct directors use another party like internal auditors to challenge you, because internal audit is again something independent which will support the management. See I have written here strategy formulation as 1 and say accountability as 2 and monitoring as 3, then what else I should write? Uh, the other thing is for the entire company to work overall right, there has to be a framework, company cannot, management cannot again, uh, this is connected to triangle, triangle cannot work their own, board has to approve policy. So, this is policy making. So, this diagram is going to be a very useful diagram, not only for this definition, your syllabus topic of board of directors, this is what board of directors are doi doing. So, now like I said, I am explaining you a lot of things and come back slowly. You are lost. What are we discussing? We learn one thing, right? If I go back to our learning, we are here. Governance and management. The difference between governance and management, it is about. Now, what is the answer? I want to write answer in one paragraph after talking about, you know, uh, 15 minutes. The difference is management is about running the business, you know making decision things like that, but governance is about what, what is the word, exercise in power, the power is what board uses and that power originated from uh, shareholders right, exercise in power for 
for strategy formulation, right, policy making and monitoring and being accountable to shareholders. So, it is different from management. Why it is different? Because governance can challenge management. That sounds is very, very important. That, that explanation is important in exam case study. If you are given a case study to say that board of directors just come and approve accounts and go, they will never challenge. Then that company's board is ineffective. They are not plain. These functions of the board, again the syllabus topic here, what is in the rectangle? under 1, 2, 3, 4, those are called functions of the board, functions, right. I, I actually explain to you that in advance, right, so that uh, I can cut down that time when I come, when it comes to board of directors, right. So, now we have learned that the difference between our one, one part of the syllabus we have learned, right, what part of the syllabus I hope you know, uh, we have learned now this part of the syllabus uh, one part right one part means i don't need to go back to the slide and show you what we learn one is definition of governance from multiple perspective and then we learn governance and management that is 4.1.1 then i am coming to the next learning point of the syllabus that is evaluate the role and limitation of corporate governance in preventing corporate failures you see this topic in the syllabus, if you read, it says case study discussion on governance failures, including the case study of uh, uh, including those caused by the global crisis and unethical behavior uh, and examination of role and limitation of corporate governance in preventing corporate failures. Right now, this is an interesting discussion. Now, if we are saying, see this good governance is an interesting word, right? It was heavily used by politics during the last few years in Sri Lanka. In Sinhalese, it is called Yahapalane, right? So, Yahapalane, good governance in Sri Lanka. Now, this Yahapalane is that same in corporate governance, yes. So, by the name of governance, sometimes misuse the word governance, right? So, when you say proper governance, I explain to you the whole idea of governance. It helps to misuse of power and it also helps to take care of everybody's interest and to be successful. That is the true governance. But the question to ask, there had been lot of companies around the world. You see this picture, this picture talks. I do not need to talk. Uh, these are billion dollar companies in the world, right? And uh, where are these companies now? I am I, sure I have pictures of some of the CEOs here. Now, these were so famous people and they were drawing salaries of millions in dollars. And where are they now? Unfortunately, some of them are still in the jail, right? And uh, do I need to put any Sri Lankan photos, right? I do not want to name now. You see some of the people who are in jail, they release now some of the so famous individual, right, ones. And where are they now? Right, that is, this is where ethics comes in a big piece uh, in your subject. Those who are greedy of money and short term vision and they do not know in the long term, this is what will happen. Now, you see some of the CEOs, uh, Tyco, this man, this CEO has collected 81 million, now this is, this is uh, not rupees, unauthorized bonus, 25 years in prison. Now, this is Eber. Right, 11 billion dollar accounting fraud in uh, WorldCom. WorldCom is a telecommunication company in the US, and this is the most famous case. Jeff Skilling, right, as the name suggests, is Skilling to kind of you know uh, to uh, maybe for manipulation, right. But now, if you look at his story, it is interesting. You can Google and see while he is in jail, he is telling you know I am innocent and he is helping other people to be developed. Now, these business leaders are in jail and even, now this is your role, right, when you become a CFO one day, so you may be surprised, right, now is it dangerous. Now, the CFO was taken, arrested and released. Now, the question to you, if you look at these companies, such big companies, Enron, I said out of Fortune 500 company, right, I think I have Enron case study here, if I am not mistaken, that is uh, kind of seventh. Uh, yeah, no need to spend time on that. I am sure about seventh 
uh, largest company, lot of people admired this company, energy giant Enron and they disappeared. But my question to you, Enron had audit committee, non-executive director, audit committee, that committee, everything they had, but why that was failed? Lehman Brothers, more than 100 year old company, finance company, right, more than 100 year old, such a billion dollar company, they could not survive during the global economic crisis time, right. Olympus, again, about 90 year old very successful Japanese company and they have a lot of issues when the when the CEO, now this is a Japanese company, CEO is a, a Britain guy, right, called Michael Woodford. He challenged one day board of directors and said, look here, I am asking you all to resign from the board because he found some irregularities where our board directly involved. Right, so all this company, and this is very close to Sri Lanka, right, this is our neighbor India, Satyam being such a bigger IT company, more than 7000 fake invoices they book as revenue, right, all of these are example of companies, I don't need to explain one by one. The question to you, while there was governance, these companies failed, why? That is a topic that this syllabus will answer, right. Now, this is interesting, I want to, I think I will just show you this quickly in the interest of time. If you look at last set of accounts Enron published, that was 2000, not, not, uh, I mean we are in 2020 now. So, see their revenue has increased from 40 billion to 100 billion and CEO is commenting that we have been able to out distance competition, right. No competition for us, out distance, but actually while making the statement, he was not aware that he had to be, uh, uh, he is going to be in jail for. Uh, you know, uh, many years, right, and the penalty that he had to pay 45 million, right. And see, I am uh, this, see why I, what I am doing now, your syllabus has a topic called case studies, right, especially corporate failures. And if you look at in the recent past there, I can tell you that as Enron was so famous, everybody knows, right, but there are a lot of other recent cases like Toshiba, Volkswagen, Right. So, these come cases you have to study as advanced corporate governance students and question what went wrong. Now, this whole story of Enron I am not going to discuss in lot of detail, but very quickly Enron was originally you know like oil company, but they grew tremendously from 10 billion to 100 billion. You see, do you see any company in 10 billion even in Sri Lanka, right? very, I mean how, what a large company. Then, this is one thing very important I want to draw your attention because we are talking about your subject is advanced business reporting, consolidation. Now, second bullet says in US special purpose entities do not need to be consolidated if independent stakeholder has 30 percent shares. Now, this is your ABR, SLFR is 10. If you want to consolidate a company, what is the rule now? Now, during this period, at Enron, right. So, now the accounting standard permitted for you to avoid consolidation under certain circumstances. You know Enron had about more than hundreds of shell companies and one of the accounting gimmick that they followed was they transferred most of the loss making assets to the shell companies. Sometimes they reported profit by selling assets to the shell company and purchasing them back and they, they hedge internally, right. You are hedging with your own company, usually hedging is done with another party. Now, they use these shell companies, you can probably say in today's discussion, we will discuss related parties, right. Now, you, they use related party, these are actually looks like related parties, but they created in such a manner that they are not consolidated. Now, this is where you can apply your SLFRS, accounting standard knowledge and question that how can they avoid consolidation and can they avoid now under the definition of new control, where it says you have to have the power over exposure, right, you have to have the power over exp exposure to variable return, right, and then you, uh, power exposure and you should be able to use the power, right, to affect the uh, variable return, right. Now, if you apply this type of definition nowadays, right, now which means consolidation rule is no longer 50 percent, right. So, when you have the exposure, there are three things, huh? one is right, you are right, right for the relevant activity, right. 
then the exposure and then uh, ability to use the right through power ability to use the power to affect the uh, variable return right. So, I will discuss some of these things when it comes to uh, group financial statements from risk of misses statement angle. What I want to say now although you do not have 50 percent holding if you say that you have right through a contract you have only 30 percent share, but you have a contract where you can control the relevant activities of a business right to change their profit and also your profit thereby you are controlling that company. So, this is the link between uh, you know accounting and this part of the syllabus governance. So, you have to critically look at even governance issues from accounting standard point of view. So, Enron one of the bigger accounting issue was they did not avoid consolidation and then you see uh, CEO left for undisclosed reason and chairman uh, left uh, and he made now a lot of these people. Now, this is very important if you look at this as a case study right CEO left for undisclosed reason right and uh, specially I am looking the last point chairman took the executive control in 2000 chairman made 100 million plus profit by selling the exercise in the share options right. And you know one of the thing Enron did while directors were exercising share options or selling they asked employees, employees invested heavily on Enron shares and they asked employees not to sell shares right. Because then you know if everybody is selling something going wrong now this is a problem in corporate governance where directors again misuse right because they know internal information and they did not this we call information asymmetry right information is not available to everybody. And then the other area to question is that uh, this one if you look at uh, nomination committee uh, former cabinet minister now one of the now these are independent directors right nomination committee direct now imagine uh, he is a chartered accountant he was paid a consultancy fee of 50,000 dollars. Now, you can convert this to rupee and see the value and remember you have to adjust time value for money this is in 2000 prior right and also every meeting 1250. Now, we have to ask a question right about how the remuneration worked for non-executive directors and this is the most interesting facts about Enron auditor Arthur Anderson. Now, that auditor earned about 52 million dollars right for the audit and consultancy. So, imagine one from one client audit firm earning 52 million and this raises question about auditors independence right and then one audit partner instructed audit team to destroy working paper and finally, this last bullet point is very important. There are dozens of reasons right that uh, board failed to heed to identify that this company is going to crash and it crash right. So, then there were more information in this slide. Now, what is the discussion from non-executives? Now, they are complaining that you know while we were outside directors we did not know what was happening in the company and then uh, so, all of that I mentioned to you about CEO going to the jail and see these are other consequences chairman got a heart attack and died later. And this was the question that I asked you earlier right. Enron had this corporate governance practices like separate CEO chair and audit committee raft many independent directors then what went wrong. Now, this type of questions are very important from exam point of view. If I ask you this question even in your study text uh, when you uh, if you look at the study text for uh, one of the thing I wanted to mention to you while your study text is not available yet the corporate governance where is it previously under your syllabus? It was the paper called KC4 right therefore, if you compare the learning outcome of KC4 and the ABR, so there is a similarity and therefore, until study pack comes certainly those similar learning outcome without any doubts you can read those chapters right. And then I am enron case study was included in the KC4 study text to go through, 
But the question that I would like to ask if this is tested like in exam context by looking at a case study, are you able to evaluate factors that contributed to failure? Because they had uh, independent directors, this committee, that committee. So, what are the questions that you want to ask? You will question these issues, right? In the interest of time, I will just put them down. Now, one of the bigger issue was the transparency. Now, in corporate governance, my explanation, we learn this as accountability. The numbers were, you know, largely misstated, especially with the use of SPA. What is SPA? Special purpose, actually it should be SPE, special purpose entity, right, where they avoided consolidation. The other thing is the lot of power, right, exercised by the CEO and then the role of independent directors, whether they actually played their role. And this point about information asymmetry, some of the critical sensitive information was not passed to other stakeholders. And we can also question the compensation methods uh, of directors, right, uh, which created lot of temptation to manipulate. This is where Enron created lot of accounting profit you know they sometimes they had contracts and they are recognizing revenue beyond one year they had they recognize profit from internal hedging this is because the variable remuneration of directors was such that they were tempted to manipulate so these are some of the reasons for failure right uh, remember another syllabus topic uh, that you want to uh, learn is sarbanes oxley act i will quickly cover this in my explanation uh, but before that, uh, I would describe this as a very critical slide and please make some notes, right? And for future reference, I am sure you can uh, capture this as an image, right? Uh, so, but understand what is important is finally, all your books notes are useless if you do not, if you cannot explain what it is and if you do not broadly remember what it is. Now, the question is if there is no governance, right? Uh, what are the issues? Now, I, by looking at these points in the slide, there are five points if you read by heading. Uh, I would probably rename the title of this slide, but uh, it says reason for governance failure is a better subject, right? Now, why there are governance failures? There are five points listed there. Remember number one reason is board, one is board is in many, this is not only Enron, right? If you look at many company, right? The board was dominated by single powerful person, right? Probably CEO chairman as one and then the non lack of involvement by the board. Board is not aware. A good example to take is Lehman Brothers. Now, some of the board members, they were zoologist. They were unable to understand the impact of those subprime mortgages prices which were you know significantly dropping. So, sometimes board cannot understand what is going on, they do not have knowledge, skill set, right. Therefore, board has not involved. In a case study, if you see board play a passive role, this is a big question. The third role, if you remember, we, we discussed that there has to be some supervision by the board. So, therefore, you should have some powerful people to bite management. What, what do I mean bite management, right? Challenge management. Now, we say auditor, sorry, board should be able to challenge management, but practically on behalf of the board, who can challenge the management? That is probably internal audit, right? So, the power given to such internal audit is also important. Then, this next area which contributed to governance failure is remuneration, which is a big topic in corporate governance. How we should remunerate executive directors, especially here excessive remuneration, which is not matching with the, uh, with the contribution and then promoting high risk taking behavior, right. So, there are failures, but they continue to get bonus. I already mentioned about internal audit that was not given prominence and mostly if you look at Enron case that we just discussed, the auditor's independence, when I say that remember auditor's independence is where auditor is or decision relating to appointment of auditor, removal of audit, auditor's fee, everything is you know advice recommended by audit committee. So, that is that kind of uh, input is important, right, and auditor's independence to identify what are the other matters that affect auditor's independence. The last uh, financial statements were misled. So, this is a question that I am coming to another learning point. If you look at our learning point now, I will put another learning point here. 
uh, see this is very important because finally after this video you will check have you learned this right and then that is the benefit of watching this video and this is helping you to pass the exam and answer this type of exam question right so i will write what we learned just now is reason for governance failures reason for governance uh, failure especially by looking at case studies right so this is what we now discuss and now uh, with that we can also discuss another important regulation in corporate governance this is like a landmark you know landmark regulation sox what is sox this is immediately after enron how us responded like now also you can ask how us respond in being the largest company affected by coronavirus how president trump is responding now versus how president george bush responded in ron failure so he wanted a very powerful he promulgated very powerful act in the us this is like us rule based model of governance right now that brings us to a important point to learn there are two models of governance around the world and please make a note those two models are called uh, rule versus principle rule based model which is common in uk us and the principle based model is the model what is the model which country uk uk even sri lanka our model of governance is uh, principle based right so what is the difference see if there is a exam question to explain the difference is again is important you should write this down what we should write rule versus principle so rule based governance is corporate governance requirements are included in the law like sarbanes oxley act the act says for example act says if you are a cfo you have to certify the accounts for accuracy right and there has to be independent directors everything in the, uh, is defined in that for example if if it is found that auditor has involved auditor has you know there are regulation for auditors and uh, say if auditor is responsible for certain conduct and auditor has failed to comply auditor is going to be in jail or pay penalties significant penalties say, according to sarbanes oxley act and then remember if it is a director who got bonus say 2 million uh, 10 million bonus director is very happy but after few months companies uh, companies making a prior adjustment this profit is now not there the moment that happens director has to return back bonus to the company so that is how Uh, U.S. Sarbanes-Oxley Act worked. So, what is the learning? If you, my question to you, what's the difference between rule-based and principle-based? Rule-based means corporate governance requirements have been right prescribed in law. Then, what is principle-based? Another interesting word for principle-based. From that, you can actually explain that it's called comply or explain approach. Comply or explain approach so what is the whole idea that while you have to comply with the corporate governance principle the approach allows some deviation as long as you can explain the rationale for the deviation that's called comply or explain approach while you have to comply it allows some flexibility to deviate provided you explain the best famous example to cite there is a requirement called ceo and chairman should be separated but in case company has combined this uh, into one person company can still explain the rationale this is why we split it right so that's that and when you look at this slide uh, sorry or no need to go to slide i'll stay with this learning point with the sarbanes oxley lot of requirements came in so if i put down some of this one is pcaob what is pcaob the first of all by looking at you know enron behavior they wanted to first control auditors right now not only auditors they wanted to control cfos the finance and the company's management as well but one of the way audit auditors were controlled by setting up a very powerful committee like in sri lanka we have similar committee called auditing and accounting standard monitoring board who will you know uh, question auditors now in us public companies accounting oversight board any auditor in us right going to audit a pcob or client registered in new york stock exchange they have to register under pcob and follow their auditing standard which are usually stricter follow their standards and then 
in addition PCOB has the right to question auditors ask you know why auditors have not qualified all this question can be direct from management point of view Sarbanes Oxley has lot of requirements now one of the very important requirement is section 404 I want you to make a note on this 404 now in many accounting failures right if you really look at why numbers went wrong remember I mentioned to you how Satyam reported more than 7000 invoices if you really go back how numbers come to financial through a control system. So then if I, I am not drawing again but if you look at financial statement in the middle the balance circle is your control system internal control system right. So if internal control is failing the numbers are going to be wrong that is why this is a very famous section now because even if you look at now your syllabus also has a topic called trend in corporate governance. If you look at our neighbors country India, in India companies act they recently introduced something similar to 404. Then you will ask what is 404, tell us about it. 404 is about management or the board is giving an opinion on internal control, opinion on internal controls. Internal controls are effective right when we say internal controls are effective three things controls are designed implemented and work in operating effectively right. So, uh, the beauty of this management can say controls are good but same opinion now when directors say this auditors have to give their independent opinion on internal control or directors report. So, that is a very important uh, change under PCOB right. Now, what are the other changes under PCOB? Uh, personal responsibility, the CEO and CFO should take personal responsibility right and they have to return their bonuses and there is something called white call a crime. So, the one frauds there is a separate section and so on. So, now what we have done now is another learning outcome in the syllabus corporate governance theory 4.2.2. Now, you can see how our session flows. The third point because if you are ready for the exam how to measure readiness, can I answer anything in the syllabus learning outcome, any question arising from syllabus learning outcome. So, the third point that I want to quickly take you through is regulation which is in the syllabus right demonstrate regulatory framework relating to corporate governance covering both local and international. So, internationally part of this I covered through Sarbanes Oxley Act and then I have I am sure a few slides to explain new governance around the world right. So, I think uh, first of all we will look at uh, governance framework in Sri Lanka. So, I want you to look at this slide take in a few uh, 30 seconds. Right. In Sri Lanka, I already mentioned to you, do we have a rule based or principle based approach? The answer is principle based, our approach is very similar to UK code. Now, but if you really look at, I would argue and say that while Sri Lanka has principle based approach, it also has some element of law and that is where if a company is a listed company listing rule requires certain corporate governance requirements. So, we will cover that. So, essentially in Sri Lanka uh, some of the things which are applicable are Companies Act number 7 of 2007. For example, some of the requirements in Companies Act they have now been included in corporate governance code right. For example, uh, there are reason when company has a serious loss of capital to call for an EGM. So, likewise there are certain requirements. And uh, so, listing rule I will mention to you specially if it is a listed company you can't say corporate governance is voluntarily they have to follow this and then there are directives issued by Securities and Exchange Commission good example they uh, of both of these is related party transaction guide. Uh, so, I will cover that and when it comes to banks central bank issued guideline on corporate governance requirement and currently what what do we have in Sri Lanka is corporate governance code 2017 which is open book for your examination. So, I am I really want you to uh, if you do not have it please download now you can download through Google if you do not have a hard copy and recommended to have the hard copy with you highlight examinable provisions because this you can carry for the exam right and I do not go through this in detail but this is simply for your knowledge in company sack directors duties are covered. 
interest in transaction of a company, this is very important in accounting, this is captured under LKS 24, right. This is a related party transaction, both of these point directors disclosing their transaction. Then other points like appointment removal, age of a director, disqualification, these are some of the provision, meeting, auditors, these are not very important. But this is very important, section 710 in Sri Lanka listing rule mandates certain corporate governance requirement. So, I will actually cover some part of Sri Lanka governance code in my presentation today. So, specially non-executive directors are required independent directors and these two committees are critical in Sri Lanka uh, remuneration committee and audit committee. So, remember these are mandatory right and then related party transaction was a big topic in Sri Lanka during the recent past starting from 2014 and then this guideline was made mandated in 2016 and they used the definition of LKS 24 and I will actually cover related parties separately in my presentation why related parties are important, but this slide simply tells you that there is a law to govern this area, companies is beyond the counting standard, there is a law if it is a listed company. And when it comes to governance in banks, there is a separate directive in Sri Lanka that is uh, uh, direction number 11 right uh, for corporate governance of bank. Now, you can see syllabus coverage as the video continues, what we have learned in the syllabus, right. So, I covered this part and I will further, I think I will further cover some of the governance framework, I am sure, yeah, uh, in other countries. Now, this slide covers that, right. So, I will come back to this slide. Uh, so, if you look at uh, this one, yeah, I think we are covering uh, this. Uh, international regulation here as well. So, when I cover this, this international regulation automatically covered. So, I am here now different models of corporate governance, American rule based model that we learned in few minutes before, right. And then there is another interesting model called European model or two tier model of governance. What do you mean by that? right and then the corporate governance and other syllabus discussion is corporate governance convergence or differentiation uh, around the world is there a similarity or dissimilarity with the trends which are emerging that is a topic uh, you know as advanced students you should be aware as a trends of uh, as as i am sure there is another syllabus topic called trends in governance which which you have to read with the latest updates right that part specifically I am not covering today, but all these are the syllabus topics other than the trends which connect to the first learning outcome. So, let me to take you through the 4.2.5 around the world. So, I hope you will write that also as a learning uh, governance models. So, I am writing uh, the next thing that we are learning uh, governance models, right. Now, look at this slide the various governance models around the world is explained here. One model which we learn American rule based model governed by Sarbanes Oxley Act. Then the UK model their trademark is called comply or explain approach where companies can comply and if they deviate they have to explain the rationale and I will explain to you European model right and uh, what is the two tier model means Japanese model. Now, uh, what is special in Japan, you can also make small notes, Japanese model, I am sure there should be another slide on this, but what is special in Japan is that they do not like these outside directors coming to the boardroom. So, usually in Japanese companies, outside directors, when I say outside directors, I refer to whom? Non-executive directors, I have not gone to nut and bolts of corporate, uh, I think I partly explained through my initial explanation who is a uh, uh, but you know when, when it comes to your level, your advanced level, uh, strategic level, I am not here to tell you who is an executive, who is a non-executive, but anyway non-executive directors main role is to have that independence to act as outside directors, bring a different perspective. So, those roles we will discuss, but what I want to say in Japan, these outside directors are not welcome, that is one thing. The other model, the model there is they call Kairestu, right, network model of governance. The whole idea is 
each company is uh, connected with stakeholders like a web of relationship meaning right for example if you are a customer in Japanese company supplier to a Japanese company right you will also be equity partner by buying some shares of the company and company in turn will buy your share so like that relationship is strengthened through cross shareholding that is the another unique thing of Japanese model there is a slide you will also notice what I explained to you. Then Asian governance model including Sri Lanka, India and other countries that one of the unique thing is what family based governance and in family based please make a note one unique thing that you will see there will be one or two shareholders who are more powerful which we call through research in Sri Lanka corporate governance research if you see they explain this as a dominant uh, shareholder. So, dominant shareholders impact is one of the topic in Sri Lanka when it comes to corporate governance. So, why there are different models of course, legally this country's legal framework stock market is different ownership structure is different in Sri Lanka family owned and finally, like I said Japanese culture. So, based on the culture this governance model depends. Now, you see this is what you have to learn. So, do not spend too much of time to read this uh, taking th 2, 3 days. Now, we discuss this slide in how many minutes. So, you have to understand that that is it close it. Uh, then uh, there are a few slides I will show you I, I have not covered you one thing right that is European 2 tier model I will come to that in few minutes and uh, draw analogy uh, for this like we did for the main governance through a triangle and uh, you know circle. Then uh, here if you look at UK governance, I think I will cover this one. This slide we already discussed Kai Res 2 in Japan right where the stakeholders are linked by small stakes right because that is the way they work for mutual benefits independent directors are not welcome right. So, that one. Then the in UK, I explained to you in my presentation today, corporate governance term was born in UK. The first time the word was used in UK in 92 and after that there were several committees called Greenbury, Hampel, Turnbull and today 2010 they combine all of this and issue combined code and as we speak UK has significantly changed their corporate governance code and publish if I am not mistaken their latest version may be 2018 with lot of changes right. Usually our governance code is aligned to UK, but now it is not aligned because there are a lot of changes to UK code. Especially some of these code uh, you can if you want make a note Greenbury committee especially on remuneration, Turnbull committee especially on uh, risk management and internal control. Then uh, Hicks report is a report on non-executive director, Smith report is a report on audit committee those are some of the specific uh, you know uh, mandate given to those committees right. Then another thing I want you to make a note before we uh, uh, end our first session that there is a guideline issued by OECD I already mentioned to you. So, now while the other courts are local courts Japan is to Japan you know Sri Lanka court for Sri Lanka internationally OECD came up with global corporate governance principle and what you can see in this slide are those principles of corporate governance. What they say is irrespective of the country you can develop a code now see now one of the syllabus topic was convergence or divergence convergence means all the countries are trying to adopt similar principles. So, this is that. Uh, so, they are prescribing one set of principles for all the countries and if you read them they make sense right. Now, every company's board responsibility should be identified agreed yes we discussed that today. And finally, one of the very important party to be benefited from corporate governance is shareholders right. So, you have to establish shareholders right to attend board meetings vote and all of that. And you cannot treat only separate you know powerful shareholders differently and smaller shareholders differently you have to treat everybody in the equal way. And like we discussed in the definition remember I explained to you societal perspective of governance as a company you should take care of stakeholders not only shareholders and another thing we discussed today was accountability and that is covered under disclosure and transparency. So, this is international guideline on corporate governance. So, similarly, there are another guideline called ICG and again if you ask me for the exam do we need to study all this is simple answer is no, but be, be 
aware about how examiner can set a question, but broadly you should know things like OECD, what principles are relevant, you have to have idea. Because when you know corporate governance, obviously you know all of this, right. So, especially our corporate governance code, you have to have a very good understanding and we are going to discuss that, right. So, uh, uh, in terms of I think we have spent about 2 hours, right, 2 hours, yeah. So, I think I am, see if you look at it is good time that I have come to this uh, what, uh, what I say bookmark kind of session break slide to show you what I have discussed up to now, right. So, I covered actually theory and practices tick, I can put a tick mark here, all the learning outcomes, right. While the session looks theoretical, as you know, we have to have some exam papers to see how this can be tested and that is what we are waiting for the pilot paper to see how questions can be tested. But again, I am recommending you go through some of the KC4 of if you are, if you are already, you know, want to see how this can be tested, the one of the recommended paper would be that. But again, when it comes to this paper, you have to look at the weightage and how question can be tested. It may vary, but learning outcome wise, you know, what examiner want to test, you can actually look, look for those question. But for the time being, first of all, do not search different papers and waste your time. If you have not understood these theoretical points or the learning outcome, that is the first thing you have to do. Right. So, do that first, because without knowledge, how are you going to answer questions? If you do not know what are the sub elements of the syllabus, you know how I broke each of these elements under theory, I broke into definition and definition is broken down into 6, about 6 definition, that is the level to which we went. So, then in my next session, I will be taking you through these two topics, board of directors and audit committee. And as you see, I have further analyzed board of directors under three big topic, right. One is a board effectiveness, which is already, if you look at the whiteboard still there, right, what I explained to you, the effectiveness of board can be explained through board functions. Remember, I covered all these words, strategy formulation, policy making, supervision, accountability. So, we have discussed, you know, in theory, but let us look at more practical. And in this session, I will take some Sri Lankan case studies to explain, you know, some of this in a more uh, practical manner, right. That is not to say earlier one is total theory, but you know, without theoretical underpinning, you will not learn something properly. And then I also mentioned in my previous explanation about diversity, right. 6 C's model I briefed you about. Then the board composition, these things are in Sri Lankan code, you know, what, how many members, senior director and so on. So, I am, uh, our next session will mostly focus on these two right and then uh, and this session is pretty much uh, I think I will give that introduction too as we start our next session. So, with that we will uh, uh, stop this session now. Thank you.